Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming, and we appreciate your um, interest in this topic. And I think this is a good follow-up to Dr. Shapiro's talk because um, we often get involved with uh, melanoma treatment after surgical therapy. And so this is an overview of what I'll be discussing today. One is the response to radiation, because decades ago it was believed that um, radiation, melanoma did not respond to radiation, but as it turns out, a lot of laboratory studies done in the 80s showed that you just had to do it a slightly different way, and I have some illustrations there. I'll talk a little bit about lymph node treatment, because that's probably most of the patients that I see, uh, and we'll talk about various indications when radiation is used for lymph node basin treatment. Uh, occasionally, we even treat the primary location, and there are certain features we look for for that reason. We'll touch a little bit about complications. And then I think uh, probably the most um, practical part uh, as an audience would be to look at some of our techniques because it's very visual and you can really get an idea of what we do. So um, this is a radiobiologic slide, but it's actually fairly uh, simple to look at. When we give radiation, we do it in, in a certain dose. That dose is called gray or centigrade, which is over here on the bottom axis. And here you have different types of tumors, and when you treat them with different doses of radiation, you can have a different response. Something like lymphoma, for example, with an increasing amount of radiation, you get an increasing amount of cell kill, which makes sense. With melanoma, which is this line up here, you have to give a fairly large amount just to make a dent in it. And so what these investigators hypothesized is that if we use radiation in larger doses per treatment, we would have a greater effect. And in fact, if we didn't exceed a certain threshold, we might have no effect at all. And we call that general concept hypofractionation. That just means we're doing slightly larger dose per day than in a treatment of breast cancer or lymphoma, for example. Uh, and that usually amounts to a lower number of total treatments. So we rarely treat a melanoma patient for six or seven weeks daily, in fact, almost never. Uh, and sometimes treatments are done in five or six treatments or, or 18 or 20. Um, this is some clinical data which was, uh, has been published over the, the last few decades um, to look to validate what was shown in the laboratory. Um, these are all retrospective data, and, and they're sort of crudely divided into patients that received less than 400 centigrade or, or greater than 400 centigrade, and that, that's a pretty substantial single dose of radiation. And what these investigators observed is that uh, again, crudely, this is uh, selection, selected patients and such, the response rates were much better when using the larger doses and substantially lower, almost twice or, or more than twice uh, the response if you use the larger dose per treatment. Uh, and others in the radiation oncology community looked at that with a little bit of skepticism. It's rare to see a two-fold difference uh, in something like this. So our national cooperative group uh, ran a study, uh, and some patients, in fact, treated NYU back in the 90s were involved in that, uh, prospectively assigning patients to uh, this treatment, which is eight gray times four. That's a very large single doses for four treatments versus 2.5 gray times 20. So that would be four weeks of daily treatment. And actually what they observed is that the responses were basically the same. Now, I would add that even this smaller dose per treatment is still a good 20, 30 percent higher than we use, let's say, in prostate cancer or breast cancer. So it is still hypofractionation, but the extreme hypofractionation that was used and believed to be better turned out was about the same as if you used these daily treatments for a four-week course of treatment. So what we have uh, um, uh, here at NYU uh, concluded from these data is that uh, while we do use larger than normal fraction sizes, uh, we tend not to use the, extreme, uh, high, the extremely large doses per fraction, and we make that decision based on location, the likelihood of side effects, uh, patient convenience, and things like that. Um, so uh, this is how this, these are how the standards of treatment have evolved over the years. Um, now moving into lymph node radiation, which, uh, as I mentioned, is probably the most common uh, type of patient that I see. Um, this is a group of, of surgical series. These would be uh, uh, not the thin melanomas that Dr. Shapiro was referring to, but larger lesions. And we look at a weighted average of patients, and this is over 3,000 uh, over a number of decades and different series. Uh, there was about a 21% failure rate. And when we do see that, we think to ourselves, what's a way that we can improve on that and improve what we call the local regional control uh, of these patients? 
And when we consider that, um, we want to select out which patients are most likely to benefit. So if a patient, for example, has a single lymph node positive, it's unlikely that they'll fall into that 21% range. They probably have a much higher rate of disease control. If they have five out of 10 lymph nodes positive, they have a higher rate of occurrence. So what investigators have done over the years, and these are our large retrospective series, is look for features that we can see on a pathology report to say that we should offer radiation to this patient. Uh, one of the main ones we look for is what we call extracapsular extension of lymph nodes. And a lymph node is just a sort of a guard station, uh, look like a marble when it's enlarged, but it has a wrapping around it. And I explained it's sort of like saran wrap. And if you have melanoma extending through that barrier, you have a much higher rate of uh, recurrence in that location. And those rates are usually on the order of 50% or so. Uh, if we have greater than or equal to four lymph nodes resected, um, that would also uh, uh, confer a higher rate of uh, lymph node positive of uh, recurrence. Uh, lymph nodes that are very large, three centimeters is, is a fairly arbitrary cut point, but a lot of investigators have identified that as a higher risk feature for recurrence. Uh, cervical lymph node location, that's in the neck. Um, the neck, by virtue of the fact that everything is in a tight space, probably confers a higher rate of recurrence. There's a lot of rich nodal tissue, in-transit lymphatics that may be at risk. And then if we have recurrent nodal disease. Uh, in, in recurrent situations, that tumor is often telling us that that tumor is biologically aggressive. So when these features are present, usually we have anywhere of a 30, 50 percent rate of recurrence, and uh, we typically do recommend radiation in those cases. Um, when we have surgery and radiation therapy used, um, recurrence rates drop substantially. So on the slide before, we see 30%, 50% rate of recurrence. When radiation is added, it's usually about a two-thirds uh, difference in uh, recurrence. So if it was 50%, that might drop to 15% or so. And I think these data uh, bear that out. Um, there was a prospective study run through an Australian group, which has been presented at a national meeting but not published, so I don't have it here. And they found a, a very similar, from about a 40% to about a 15% rate of recurrence when these features, when any of these features are present. Um, so there are a lot of data, both retrospective and prospective, to support uh, this treatment program. Uh, now, when do we do radiation to the primary site? This is a little more nuanced, and I would say with radiation for melanoma, every case is somewhat nuanced. So I'm sort of talking about generalities here, um, but there are always exceptions to the rule. Um, but some features that we look at very closely are ulceration. Uh, ulceration tends to uh, happen in, in, in the thicker lesions. Um, desmoplastic subtype is a type of melanoma which tends to spread almost like with little fingers around it and little skip areas. And there have been surgical series showing a higher rate of recurrence in desmoplastic subtypes. So we typically, not in every case, but typically do recommend uh, radiation therapy for desmoplastic subtypes. Um, satellite lesions, which Dr. Shapiro showed earlier, uh, are at very high risk. They've already demonstrated uh, um, that they have spread beyond the index lesion. So that usually confers uh, a need for radiation therapy. And the uh, table on the right shows a general uh, pattern of recurrence uh, when these features are present. So um, uh, this is a, a study done uh, which tried to uh, look at thickness and then location of tumors and identify who might have a higher or lower rate of recurrence. Uh, and just broadly speaking, uh, head and neck or, or lower extremities tended to have a higher rate of recurrence, particularly when they were ulcerated. So when you have ulcerated lesions, um, that confers a higher rate uh, of recurrence at the primary site. And that's something that we do look at um, when identifying patients for radiation therapy. Um, here we're looking more closely at desmoplastic subtype. That's the one with that uh, somewhat insidious type of uh, um, extension, finger-like extension. And we see recurrence rates in excess of 20%, some as high as 50%. I would say that there are a few papers which show lower recurrence rates too, but I think the preponderance of the evidence suggests that um, radiation is, is uh, an, a wise decision in this particular subtype of melanoma. Moving on a little bit to complications, uh, and this is from uh, the MD Anderson Cancer Center, just looking at overall rates of treatment complications in, in head and neck uh, melanoma. 
And here they have uh, grade one and two, both in the 10 to 15 percent range. <laughs> Uh, many of us would su suggest that it may be slightly higher than that. Um, this is aggressive therapy, to be sure. It's an aggressive tumor, and if patients are seeing me, they've usually had at least one, if not more, risk features to suggest a higher level of aggression. So uh, we do have to offer aggressive therapy here. Um, but we do believe that those complication rates are well within uh, reason, such that the benefits of treatment do outweigh the risks. Some of the complications you might see in head and neck radiation example might be uh, dryness of the mouth, if the salivary glands are close by, fibrosis in the neck, which is sort of a stiffening of the tissue, and then some skin changes, which are usually subtle, but occasionally there can be uh, changes in the skin texture uh, over the long term. Uh, this is another example of uh, radiation to the axilla, which is the armpit area. Uh, this is a different type of complication because we are dealing with a different part of the body. Uh, and the main complication here is uh, swelling of the arm, which is called lymphedema. Uh, this, again, is from the MD Anderson, and they show mild to moderate lymphedema, each present at about a 20% rate, so about a 40% overall rate of lymphedema. Uh, I would suggest that in, in, in my own practice, in patients who I've treated after surgery, uh, it's very rare to find someone where let's say the right side, which was treated is exactly the same as the left. There's almost always a slight difference, but the clinically significant lymphedema, which requires either compression devices or physical therapy, is in the range of, of 20 to 35 uh, percent, and that's very similar to what's found in breast cancer and other diseases. Uh, this is a broad listing of complications by location. Uh, at the head and head neck, you see uh, uh, skin changes. Uh, and certainly for the, the early stage complications, it happens in almost every patient. Um, but what we're really looking for are the grade three toxicities here, and they're relatively low. Um, uh, as we move from the head and neck to the axilla and then to the inguinal region, which is the groin, the toxicities tend to go up. Um, the groin, by virtue of the fact that gravity tends to uh, work uh, against us as far as uh, swelling goes because uh, fluid tends to, to go with gravity, uh, have an even higher rate of uh, lymphedema uh, when using radiation after surgery. Um, but this is a listing of all of the potential complications that we may see uh, when using uh, radiation for this type of therapy. Um, these are our crude complication rates uh, of any grade over time, and I think the take-home message here is that uh, when surgical therapy is done by itself, you have relatively no, low, not zero, rates of complications. Similarly, when we treat uh, the head and neck or the axilla of the groin in the absence of surgery, we have similarly low rates of complications. But when you add the two together, that's when you have the higher uh, risk of complications. But this is by necessity because we're treating a, a higher stage of disease. Um, lymphedema, for example, and when I explain this to patients, is like a drainage system from the limb or, or wherever. And if you have some type of disruption, whether it be surgical or radiation, you predispose patients to having impaired drainage. And certainly when you have both, you have sort of a double whammy there. So uh, that's something that uh, we do see, we do counsel patients on. But if we can manage it early, uh, usually those results are, are relatively good. Um, here we go on to clinically significant lymphedema rates. Again, these are accrued rates. A lot of this is from MD Anderson. Um, and particularly in the groin, you see very high rates of lymphedema here. I would counsel patients, if I'm treating them in the groin area, that that is something to expect to some extent. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of how much. Uh, and that way, patients expect this, this to happen, and we can manage it uh, as we move forward. Uh, now moving on to radiation techniques, and there are a lot of ways to administer radiation, but I would put them into two broad categories. One of them is to use it superficially, uh, and that's with what we call an electron beam. Uh, electrons, if you remember back to high school chemistry, are small negatively charged particles. And then it's with x-rays is the other way, and, and the, the photo on the right uh, would represent x-rays, the one on the left would represent electrons. Um, and the way this might work, and this is a, a patient that was treated in our center uh, with a lesion on the scalp, could be similar to the one Dr. Shapiro presented uh, with the lesion on the head. Uh, this is an example of electron treatment. And all we do is identify clinically, when the patient is in our department, what parts of, of the skin we want to treat. 
Uh, and if we need to treat anything besides the skin, like the underlying lymph nodes, we identify those as well. Patients come in for a planning session and we can mark out exactly what we want to do. Now, some of the technical challenges uh, of radiation, and particularly when we're dealing with the scalp, is that when there's curvatures to a surface, that um, often results in a difference in the way the dose is distributed. So, for example, here, uh, because of the curvatures involved, it would be impossible to treat everything in one contiguous radiation field. And so what we often do is break it up. So we can treat the back, let's say, from this location, and then set up a slightly different angle to treat the mid portion and yet a different angle for the bottom. And that's how this might work here. So uh, we have uh, uh, field matching that we use in certain locations. And this is not only in the scalp, but in other locations too, so that we can get the dose where we want to without unnecessarily treating other structures and still getting the dose we want to the volume at risk. And this is an example of how this might look in three dimensions. Uh, this is the same patient. And this red sort of uh, um, color wash here would represent the the target that we want to, uh, to treat. Um, one of the things in radiation, in addition to treating the target adequately, is we want to avoid toxicities to the underlying tissue. And of course, up in the scalp, we have the brain not too far away. And there are ways for us to avoid that. Um, one of those ways is when we're using electron beam therapies to select an appropriate energy. Uh, sounds very fancy, but it's actually extremely simple. As we go higher in electron beam energy, we have greater penetration. So when we're treating something like the scalp, we only need, let's say, several millimeters of penetration. We can select a low energy, seven or nine mega electron volts. Whereas we're treating something much deeper, we might have to go much higher. Uh, other things we can do are apply what we call bolus. Bolus is, is just a tissue equivalent material. It's like a piece of rubber that we place on the body, and if we place, for example, a piece of bolus on the scalp here, we can lift that dose right off the underlying tissue, which may be the brain if we're treating a scalp. So there are different things we can do to um, modulate the intensity of the radiation so as to get the desired dose in the location we want to treat, but yet keep doses to critical structures uh, within acceptable limits. Uh, and this is an example of how bolus would be placed. This is a, uh, in the actual treatment room, it's just a piece of uh, uh, soft plastic. Um, but this is how it looks when we're looking at it technically. And this is how the dose distribution would look in that case, where we have the uh, prescribed dose uh, to the skin and just uh, meeting the skull and uh, essentially no dose to the underlying brain. Uh, and this is, uh, again, the three-dimensional dose distribution of, of how this works. When we have field matching, uh, we often have to do uh, other modifications because when we put two beams together, there's a little bit of feathering we have to do. But that's all part of, of the technical work that we do every day. Uh, so really no big deal. Uh, moving on now to a, a different type of radiation, which I'll comment on just in the last few minutes, is uh, radiosurgery. Radiosurgery is a fancy word for focused radiation, where we can uh, focus uh, radiation coming from a number of different radiation sources on one point. Uh, this is something which was developed uh, uh, probably about 30 years ago uh, in Sweden by Lars Lexel, uh, and he developed a device called the Gamma Knife, which has um, about 60 or so very small cobalt radiation sources, which are placed in a big helmet. And patients are, are sort of lying on this table, and they have this frame put on, which mounts to their helmet. Then they come into this machine, and radiation can converge on a particular place. Uh, and one of the uh, indications that we commonly use here is gamma knife radiosurgery for uh, melanoma brain metastases. I think Dr. Shapiro presented a slide where that's probably the third most common location that melanoma can spread to. And uh, this is an example of how the uh, frame, the helmet, this is, I'm sorry, this is the helmet. This is a frame here, uh, which looks like a very uh, crude device. It's a big set of metal bars, and it's actually screwed into the skull under local anesthesia, although it only takes a few minutes, and uh, patients really don't have a problem with it. Um, they have specialized imaging done so that those, uh, any suspicious areas are identified with neuroradiology and neurosurgery. And this is all done over the course of, let's say, a morning. And uh, at the conclusion of all of this planning, 
they have their gamma knife treatment. This is a sort of a uh, figure representing how it might look where the radiation from most, if not all, of these sources can converge on a single place, give a very high dose of radiation to one location. Uh, again, very good for melanoma, good for other tumors too, but almost uniquely suited to melanoma, uh, and provide uh, control in that location without having to treat uh, a lot of the brain, and that's a good thing. So um, this is one area that we use uh, fairly commonly in, in most malignancies, but especially uh, related to melanoma. So just looking at uh, a few conclusions here, um, radiation now has a pretty established role in the management, management of melanoma. Uh, data not only retrospective but prospective have um, validated its efficacy in nodal basin treatment, for example, uh, in selected cases for, pri for primary treatment, uh, and certainly in, in unique situations like radio, uh, radio surgery. Um, so that's all I have for you today. Thank you.